Ford Motor Company manufactured 5.5 million vehicles in 2019. They sell over $156 billion worth of products annually. The man behind Ford Motor Company is known to have revolutionized automobile industry. In today's episode, we will discuss the first sale of Ford Motor Company. Henry's father, William Ford, crossed Atlantic from Ireland, his destination, Dearborn, Michigan, where two uncles had settled in 15 years ago. William worked as a carpenter for the Michigan Central Railroad. After working for 11 years, he finally was able to afford farmland. William bought the land for $600, hoping he could pass it on to his family, a wish of his that never came to be true. William married Mary, and in 1863, the couple welcomed Henry. Young Henry was like any other child. He loved birds, thought highly of his mother. As the story goes, one day Henry was caught lying to his mother. Mary ignored him for an entire day. Henry was ashamed as he puts it, shame cuts more deeply than a whip. Henry at seven started school, but at 12, he went through one of the most painful events of his life. Mary Ford had passed away. For a child who used to spend time under a shade, became even quieter, keeping everything to himself. Henry's walk to school was alone now. One day as he was walking back home, he saw a self-propelled steam engine. Inspired by what he saw, he got home, started to replicate the engine. This was Henry's first experiment in designing a practical machine. At 16, Henry left school and got a job that paid him $1.10 a day. At work, he would question his manager and come up with a better solution. This was not appreciated by the bosses, and they fired him because he was too good at his job. His second job was shaping hexagons on brass valve, where he made $2 a week. After working for about nine months, he accepted a job at the Detroit Dry Dock Engine Works for $2 a week. In 1882, Henry moves back to Dearborn for nine months, where he celebrated his 21st birthday. His father gifted him a 40 acres property, thinking that Henry would become a farmer. But Henry had other plans. He took courses at a college on bookkeeping, mechanical drawings, and business practices. In his free time, he would read technical magazines and perform experiments of steam and gas engines. While spending time on the farmland, Henry met Clara. Two months after meeting, they were engaged, and on April 11, 1887, they were married. The couple lived at the farm before moving to a house that Henry had built. To improve his understanding on electricity, Henry took a job at the Edison Illuminating Company. He told Clara that he wanted to build a vehicle, and it was important that he joined a company where he could learn about electrical components. They decided to move to Detroit and had their first child. Henry was 30 now. For his dream to become a reality, he had to start experimenting. Henry hated horse carriages, so in 1893, he bought a bike to travel around. Bikes were getting popular, and the bylaws decided to redesign roads to make riding smoother. Redesigning roads was an opportunity to introduce a self-propelled vehicle. And so in 1893, first gasoline-powered buggy was seen on street in the U.S., an article in the Detroit Free Press described the buggy as the first horseless carriage. It weighed about 1,300 pounds and had a speed of 6 miles per hour. The newspaper reported every detail about the test run, the street the carriage was seen on, the amusement on the spectator's face. They did, however, miss one little detail, one man who was following the buggy on his bicycle, Henry Ford. Henry was following the carriage for a much bigger purpose. He knew that he could design a car that is lighter, consumed less fuel. While working at the Edison, Henry visited friend's shop to work on an engine. For the next six weeks, Henry kept himself busy between Edison and his engine design. On Christmas Eve of 1893, Henry and his wife Clara tested out the engine at their kitchen table. After pouring gas in the engine, he turned the ignition on and the engine made a roaring sound. With the success, a man named Charles King joined Henry and brought along his assistant Oliver. The team went to work converting the engine into an actual car. The end product was a 500-pound quadricycle that had no reverse and there were no brakes, but it ran on its own. The first test run was on a rainy day. Clara was holding a clock and Jim was riding a bicycle in front of the quadricycle to warn other drivers of Henry's test drive. 
This was a historic experiment, the beginning of the automobile industry as we know of it today. After the success of Quadricycle, Henry discussed his finding with Edison. Edison told Henry to pursue his dream. To finance his endeavor, Henry sold Quadricycle for $200. To raise more funds, Henry meet the mayor, William Mayberry. The mayor's connections helped him raise $15,000. As now Henry wanted to pursue his passion full-time, he left Edison and started Detroit Automobile Company. But instead of manufacturing the prototype that Henry had designed, they introduced a slab-sided delivery truck. The orders were coming in, but were not fulfilled. Fifteen months into the new company, they had nothing to show for except for an assembled truck and an operating loss of $86,000. Henry was being forced into doing something he didn't want to. He would disappear for hours, telling employees if an investor was to ask for him, tell him that I had to go out of town. With the no profit and only losses, the company had to shut down. Henry had no money. He started sharing expenses with his father, who decided to move in with Henry. Determined to make a car work, Henry started to work on a race car. Henry's plan was to take part in a 10-mile race, where the winner would receive $1,000. As it turned out, only three cars made it to the track, one of which had to be disqualified due to a leaking cylinder. The track was set for two cars, a favorite Alexander Winton and a local farm boy, Henry. The two car get to the starting line. Henry was nervous. This was his first race. Alexander had a powerful start, leaving Henry trailing behind. But then came the seventh lap, where Alexander's car started to boil and slow down. Henry crossed him and stayed ahead, proving that his car was reliable. That race brought him more investors, which helped Henry build another company, the Henry Ford Company. After the race, Henry was in the mood of building a racer. He went to his friend's workshop and started to work on his plans. His race was seen by a bicycle racer, Tom Cooper, who was willing to invest in Henry's plan. The work went on for weeks. The end result was a 10 feet long, 5 feet wide, and a 36 inch tires car. Their plan was to tour the country and participate in races, but neither men wanted to drive in an actual race. For this, they brought in Barney Oldfield. Barney drove the 999 and finished the lap in a record 5 minutes and 28 seconds. After winning the race, Henry had enough investors to fund him. He started to work on a passenger car under the company name Ford and Malcolmson LTD. Later, the firm was changed into Ford Motor Company. Alexander Malcolmson was a leading coal merchant who agreed to provide $7,000, but soon more money was needed. Malcolmson was already in debt and banks were avoiding Henry because of his past. Malcolmson managed to find 12 investors who were willing to invest in Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company started manufacturing a passenger car. The assembly took a while. They were down to their last $223.65. But then a dentist paid $850 for a Model A. This was their first sale. Henry at 40 had finally achieved his dream of building a self-driving car. In the coming nine months, they sold 658 Model A's, with a return of 350%. Ford Motor Company was now considered the greatest industrial empire. On Henry's last day, he had breakfast, visited Engineering Laboratory, Administration Building, the Catholic Cemetery paying respect to his friends and family. Maybe he knew that he will be joining them soon. That day, he came back home and went to sleep in Claire's lap. He never did wake after. He once said that, if you think you can, or think you can't, you're right. So, do you think you can, and you will? Until next time, have a good one.